Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in tonight. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan and all of us at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual evening with Dr. Carl Hart to discuss Drug Use for Adults, Chasing Liberty in the Land of Fear, published by our friends at Penguin. Dr. Hart is Ziff Professor of Psychology in the Departments of Psychology and Psychiatry at Columbia University. In Drug Use for Grownups, he draws on decades of research and his own personal experience to argue that the criminalization and demonization of drug use, not drugs themselves, have been a tremendous scourge on America, not least in reinforcing this country's enduring structural racism. To moderate this evening's conversation, we're joined by Neil Brennan. Neil is a director, writer, actor, and comedian known for creating and co-writing the Comedy Central series, Chappelle's Show with Dave Chappelle. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by clicking the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen, and you can order your copy of Drug Use for Adults from Books and Books below by pressing the green button. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers every, everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Give me just a sec. Here we go. There you go. Uh, <laughs> can you hear us? <laughs> Perfectly is, it well. is it just you and I? It's just you and me, man. Oh, all right. And hundreds uh, of other people watching. Oh, good. Okay. Can we just have to act like it's just you and me, like we do? Yeah. Just hold for, we're holding for applause right now. Hello. Um. So, I mean, Carl, I guess the, let's just start with first principles. Like, what do you, what do you, wh how did you come to, what's your relationship with drugs been? in your life? Because I found that part of the book interesting. Well, you know, uh, I've been studying drugs for about 30 years. Uh, and so that's been my main relationship to drugs. And when you say studying, it's not like I studied some drugs. It's like <laughs> you literally people laugh when I tell them this, but you have drug addicts in a laboratory, correct? Yeah, that's right. We bring people. I mean, some people meet criteria for substance use disorder. Some people don't. We bring them into the lab. We study the effects of various drugs like crack cocaine, marijuana, heroin, uh, you name it. We study the effects of these drugs on their behavior, on their brain, on sleep, on food intake, a wide range of effects in order to know what drugs do and don't do. Um, and how did you, I cut you off and rerouted you. Explain your, um, your character arc your understanding of drugs from the age of say 12 to now? Yeah, you know, so like we are here at Books and Books virtually. Uh, this is uh, my, one of Miami's, uh, well, it's Miami's most important bookstore. And so this is my hometown. Uh, you talk about age of 12. Um, we're talking about the late 1970s, early 80s. Uh, powder cocaine is a big deal. Uh, soon there later, uh, soon thereafter, the crack will become a big deal. Uh, and of course, people said that crack was the reason for all of the problems that we saw in our community. Things like high unemployment rates, um, underemployment, uh, lack of education, all of those sorts of things. And so I started to uh, become interested in drugs because I wanted to learn about drugs in order to um, be able to help people deal with drug, to deal with drug addiction. Of course. And you thought, but you're, you took, you, you drank the Kool-Aid. Oh, Nancy Reagan, uh, absolutely. all of it. it. It's a scourge. What was it like from uh, like first person? What did you see your neighborhood become devoured? Because having not grow, but grown up in a, in a, in a, in, in a neighborhood that was devoured by drug use, I have a lot of friends who say it was so obvious what the problem was, and it was crack. Yeah, it's a very interesting thing. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. Um, you know, I was low-key down with Nancy Reagan when she was saying 
just say no. Um, um, and so I thought like, this is what conscious, uh, conscious brothers did. You told people to stay away from drugs because it can't, you know, I was also a big supporter of a uh, fan of public enemy and people who were saying drugs were destroying the community, uh, new Jack city, all of those kinds of things I thought were dope. I thought that that was, um, what the, what the evidence was. And, um, but what happened, as I learned later, is that I confused what was going on just like everybody else. Uh, for example, I'll just uh, the highest unemployment rates, uh, some of the highest unemployment rates in the United States was 1982. Crack cocaine does not appear until late 1984 in, in like L.A. and the rest of the country, not until late 1985. Um, so you got the highest unemployment rates and also you have a spike in murder in 1980. But all of these sorts of things, crack is blamed and it, the, the evidence just not fit the time, the time course. It is true that crack was a new phenomenon, but crack was crack, crack use was never had never outpaced powder cocaine use. Crack use was always relatively low. Um, and then the people who they said was making all of this money, you know, the cats on the corner, they were still living at home with their mom. Yeah, I mean, so it, ends like, up being, it ends up being minimum wage. Yeah. Um, and and then slowly, but and you join you you were in the military, and yeah. still banging the drum, the anti drug. Not like you're banging the drum. That's just your belief system was that you were just a regular dude. Yeah. Um. And then, and then you came back to the states, and and what what sort of got you? What opened your eyes, so to speak? Uh, what really opened my eyes? It wasn't like this aha moment. It wasn't this epiphany. It was just an accumulation of evidence that just caused me cognitive dissonance. For example, we said like crack destroyed the black community. Uh, as I learned later in life from various friends, there was far more crack in white communities and their communities weren't destroyed. Uh, I object. I'm kidding. No. <laughs> you know, at your, your your house, you know, going to your crib, yeah. Uh, yeah. bringing people into the lab and you give them crack and then you see that um, they behave responsibly. Um, they are able to follow directions. Uh, you don't see all of this sort of uh, behaviors that was described in the press. Um, that also question made me question. Then when you start to look at the number of people who, who use crack and were addicted, uh, maybe 20 percent, 25 percent, whereas that, that means that the majority of people who use crack were, were not addicted. And so all of this stuff started to conflict what, what I was what I thought was the truth. And so this caused causing cognitive dissonance. It made me reevaluate my position like you're supposed to do. You're supposed to follow the evidence and evidence just didn't fit that story. Uh, well, you could have also just uh, dug your heels in. Well, I'm not ignorant. Do. I'm not um, ignorant or cognitively inflexible. And that's not what you do in science or education. It's, it's just like, well, you may as well give up your job. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, so when you, so you do do tests and you found that around 20% of people that participate in crack uh you can are you know palpably whatever your what's your your uh, definition of of uh addiction well when i use the term addiction i'm using the uh, the term that's in the dsm the diagnostic T statistical manual of the american psychiatric association it just simply means that people are having psychosocial disruptions as a result of their drug use and they are disturbed by these disruptions. Like, for example, they don't go to work. Um, they're not meeting family obligations. They're not meeting other obligations. They have tried to quit on uh, several uh, unsuccessful attempts and um, things like that. That's what I mean when I'm talking about drug addiction. Um, okay. And then you, so you, you come to that conclusion and that's, how, what, what window between 2000 and 2005? Oh, uh, no, man. We're talking, um, it wasn't really until about 2010 where okay. I was really starting to say, like, oh, something's going on here. This is really wrong. And you're presenting this evidence somewhat, right? Yep, that's right. 
and uh, to get boards, councils, learning group, like study group. Who do you pre- who does one present uh, the evidence to? Well, you know, I'm a professor, so I teach my courses. I uh, uh, present it to students, to other scientists at meetings, um, in the scientific literature, in the popular press, uh, in a variety of ways. But people, uh, the story is just too good. You can't compete with popular culture. I mean, like the filmmakers, you can't compete with them. Uh, the journalists, it's hard to compete with this story that cracked, destroyed the community crack and then now uh it's opioids right absolutely so now it's opioids and now there's a concern for um uh working class white communities um at the time uh people were saying that crack destroyed black communities when we think about now when we're talking about the opioids it's like it's not the opioids it's the fact that companies like gm and other companies move their factories to other countries and tuck away middle class jobs. And that's what destroyed those communities. The same is true with crack. It's like high unemployment rates. And that's the thing that caused the problem that people saw, but they confused it and they scapegoated crack. Is, is the, is opioid use similar amongst races? Uh, Opioid use is more, uh, there are far more white folks that use opioids than uh, any other races. Uh, then when you look at the uh, the sheer numbers of people who use something like crack, there are far more white folks who use crack than black people. But that's not the narrative that we have in the United States. I will say that, I, well, the reason I ask is because I never hear about black people and opioids, which it's, I can't believe the press is missing an opportunity to scapegoat black people. It's not like them. Uh, no, I mean, uh, black people use opioids, so let's not get it twisted. We are all humans. Uh, right. but when you look at the arrest data, 80% of the people who are arrested for some like heroin trafficking or heroin related crimes are black and brown people. Even oh, though, so they are. Okay. Even though they don't use the drug as much. Well, yeah, the, the empathy now goes to the user. Uh, they still have to crack down on the, on the trafficker. Um, That's right. Because so, you you can vilify the you can vilify the trafficker as some de- degenerate who is of of a uh, minority race. Yeah. Uh, whereas it's hard to do that so much with the opioids because we're seeing all of these people in the Rust Belt who are having problems with opioid use, and in the Rust Belt, it is predominantly white and and uh, folks who were once middle class, but now um, they are struggling. So, okay, so now we'll, trans, uh, we'll, we'll uh, transition into the other sort of revelation of the book, which is um, you acknowledge that you do heroin sometimes and you do uh, MDMA and you do meth. It, I, I, dude, I got to tell you, I had to read it. <laughs> several times because I thought because you sent me the galleys a while ago and I it was like one of these like what did I just read <laughs> type things but 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 I also do alcohol every now and then I do caffeine every now and then you didn't mention that I sure um, didn't these are all drugs um yeah. and, and and they're all done to achieve a certain goal when people take caffeine in the morning they're trying to get some pep, they drink alcohol in the evenings with friends or whatever, it's to serve as a local, uh, a social lubricant. Uh, the same is true with something like heroin. Heroin can serve as a social lubricant. It can serve as an agent that will help uh, you to become more uh, forgiving, uh, more open, all of these sorts of things. So um, the fact that people are shocked by these sort of revelations it speaks more to the person who's shocked uh, and speaks more to us as adolescents in our sort of thinking about drugs. It's like, um, uh, it's okay uh, for uh, us to be to be prescribed amphetamines or something else, uh, yeah. but it's not okay for people to take it uh, to enhance sexual pleasure, for example. This is nonsense. As an adult, uh, as you know, in the book, I point out, 
as Americans, we are guaranteed at least, at least three birthrights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Oh, Americans think about this in these jingoistic terms, and they don't really understand what that means. And, I'm, uh, and in the book, I tried to explain what that means. It means that you have the right to live your life as you see fit, so long as you don't prevent other people from doing the same. That's what it means. That's what the founding fathers meant it to be. I mean, the founding fathers, of course, they had their issues. They were human. But these principles are uh, beyond reproach. Um, 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 uh, and so when we have to separate the principles from the men, uh, but when you look at these principles, we all claim to uh, support and, and uh, we claim to be the freest country on, uh, on the earth, when in fact, we don't know what freedom is. Yeah, I mean, it's, this is, these are, as you point out in the book, it's not just America, you had problems in, Philippines with Duterte, literally Duterte, not yes. like one of his boys, Duterte yeah. tweeted right. about Carl Hart. Yes. Um, it's more, I mean, there are so the amount of, if you just went by population, 98% of the world lives in, in basically societies, cultures of like abstinence, for lack of a better word. Or I don't know if it's that of, high, but. A lot of the countries who are depending on American aid certainly have to have to they have to make sure their drug policy aligns with ours. And in other countries like um, Portugal, uh, Switzerland, um, they do their own thing. Uh, they they have departed from what we're doing uh, with our drug policy, uh, in part because they care more about their people uh, than they care about what what we have to say about what they're doing. But it is only. So it's Portugal, Switzerland, Spain, anywhere South America? Oh, uh, no. Um, South America, uh, no. Uh, Colombia uh, had, uh, I be, at one point, they had, decre they had decriminalized all drugs. Mexico decriminalized all drugs, believe it or not, but the amounts that were decriminalized were so small, it really uh, became moot at that point. Um, uh, but Colombia was on the way, and I think they, uh, I don't think they are currently decriminalized. Okay. So, as somebody, you, so you're, what you're advocating overall is uh, libertarianism as it pertains to drugs, right? No, and, I don't, I don't like to be put in like those boxes. Okay. I think uh, yeah, that's like yeah. some dumb football okay, yeah. What uh, you you you're advocating for legalization of drugs? Right? That's right. Okay. Drug regulation. Yeah. We regulate the market. Uh, yes, that's that's the big kind of sticking point because explain the the testing thing that they have that you volunteer at at these festivals. Yeah. So let's just take a step back and think about what we're saying about the opioid crisis in the United States. In the United States, you see these headlines, 70, 80,000 Americans die from overdoses. And then immediately after that, you see something about opioids. So the idea is that people are dying from opioids. Uh, and there are some problems with that, and I, I talk about in the book. But the bottom line here is that when people die from a drug-related death, in large part, it's because they got contaminated substance. That is, they got a drug, for example, like a fentanyl analog, when they thought that they were getting heroin. A fentanyl analog is far more potent than heroin. So just a small amount of that could cause people some problems and they can have respiratory depression and die. And these are, these are basically just the drugs are stepped on. They're, right. they're, they just, they're larded down with baby laxative for, you know, just the, the throw some fentanyl in the throw whatever kind of whatever's laying around that will increase the high in, in uh, sensibly, right? Well, yeah, right. So you throw fentanyl in there, uh, it, uh, less of the substance is required. So you save money as a dealer. Um, and But the problem is uh, your customers don't know that it's fentanyl and not heroin. One of the ways that the Spanish, for example, have chosen to deal with this is that they have implemented these free dr drug checking facilities around the country such that people can submit small amounts of their drug to have it tested for its chemical composition, 
and the dose of these composite these chemicals in the substance. And then you get a printout and some education about what those substances are. And that way you can decide whether to take the substance or not. You can know whether or not your substance is actually heroin or a fentanyl uh, analog. That way you prevent people from dying from overdoses. We have that technology here in the United States, but we haven't made it available to our public. So when people talk about they're concerned about the opioid crisis and they're not advocating for these services, it's bullshit. And that's what uh, that's the thing that frustrates me because we could be saving people and we have not chosen to do so. And because the truth is they're not dying from opioids. The truth is, is that they're dying primarily from ignorance. Yes, they're because they're they're they don't know what's in their substance. Yes. Yeah, they don't know what they're eating. They That's don't know right. what they're taking and no one and the powers that be uh, won't allow them to have the information. Absolutely. So if we just go back in history. We had a similar problem when we outlawed alcohol between 1920 and 1933. People were dying from tainted alcohol. People were being maimed from tainted alcohol. When we reversed alcohol prohibition with the 21st Amendment in 1933, those deaths and that, and that uh, those injuries, they went away. So that's not even the violence. It's literally they got bad hooch, so to speak. Absolutely. And people died and were maimed. Um, and we know this history. Right. Um, and so, so you, uh, yeah, I want to reiterate that thing that, again, most people don't die from heroin overdoses. It's, thing it's whatever was in the heroin uh or and a lot of times a lot of heroin overdoses are are uh mixing with alcohol right absolutely that's another thing that like 40 percent or something it's a large percentage see the alcohol another sedative like an older older antihistamine uh, a benzodiazepine a nerve agent like neurontin or gabapentin those sorts of things also increase the likelihood of respiratory depression Many people don't know this. So we can have public service announcements saying, if you're going to use opioids, especially if you are a novice, don't mix it with these other things. Yeah. Okay. So you, you, you really do kind of back it up with the facts. Um, and, and, and then you, you have some sort of advice, right? For people Let's say I get some uh, an opioid, or I get a uh, uh, heroin, or I get something through illegal means, right? I mean, I think it it would be impossible to get it at, from most people's point of view through legal means. But what advice do you give people? If people uh, if people get drugs through illegal means, yes, uh, I don't usually give advice for that. Okay. Um, I mean, but I would like I would like people to know what's in their substance. I mean, if they can. But so my sort of uh, or what's your what's your philosophy when you do? Because the, the way you you describe your drug taking is uh, you'll take it if you have to go to like a t like just a, a like a political function where you just have to kind of schmooze and talk. You have one, you have different drugs for different events, right? Yeah, just like um, when you wake up, you don't do alcohol, you do caffeine, right? Right. Um, and, and your, but, and, and, but you have a protocol in terms of uh, you're big on set and setting and, and sort of like make it right if you're going to do it. Oh, absolutely. So this book is called Drug Use for Grownups. And we haven't talked about, you know, what is what is a grown-up. And a grown-up, in short, is those folks who are responsible. They meet their obligations. And so your drug use is uh, just like any other activity. I mean, for example, uh, I love going to co uh, live comedy, love seeing you. Uh, I have to set aside time to do that, a uh, couple hours to go do that. Um, I don't have anything else to do. I clear off the calendar. The same is true with your drug use. You be responsible. You set aside time. Uh, you make sure that you have that time blocked out for that activity. 
you make sure that you are healthy, you slept well, you ate well, all of those things can enhance the experience. If you're if you're not taking care of those things, then you increase the likelihood of having negative effects. And so all of this sort of information certainly is in the book. Yeah, and and I would like to point out that uh, I've never done heroin and I was late. You were on time for this <laughs> as an example, as an example of like, it does, you were, you were texting me like, where are you? Um, the heroin user was texting the, the straight edge motherfucker. Um, hey, see, well, see, that's the problem. Like, you know, heroin is one of the things I do, but I also have published <laughs> multiple books. I've also, the, yes, the, the meth user, whatever, whatever you use for whatever. But I like the idea of using a different thing for different activities because it makes it 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 you have an approach and you have a philosophy and you talk about doing, uh, I believe, meth with your wife on the weekends just to connect with your wife. Yeah. And you guys just hang out and connect. Well, this is not strange for adults. You know, it's like saying that, oh. You have multiple sexual positions. Uh, I mean, Wait, there's what? a variety of. There's the, the first <laughs> I'm hearing of it. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> That's that. You know, adults, you have these sort of different sort of things that you do for variety and also for the sit whatever the situation calls for. This is not strange. This is normal. I hope other adults do the same sort of things. Yes, but Carl, doggy style, Ill, doggy style is illegal. <laughs> is the problem. I mean, you're acting like, come on, we all know that. No, dude, doggy style is not. You can only do doggy style in Switzerland and Portugal. Yeah, Neil, right. And so when we think about why doggy style is illegal, you understand that these drugs are illegal because of racism and not because of Correct. pharmacology. Well, that's what I was going to get, because my only argument against your like philosophy is uh is and you can you can i'm sure you have an answer um is that the assumption like if if 10 to 20 percent of people get addicted to crack if a lot of people do crack that's a lot of crack addicts right yep. if it's a bit like and and your your observation is in most cases is these are uh cultural and systemic and uh, their pre-existing problems exist in the communities of most uh, what we call addicts, right? Like that, you know, you can't destroy a neighborhood unless it's there to be destroyed. Um, so what I would say is in a country as sort of screwed up as America, uh, what do you say about the, the pre-existing comorbidities as it pertains to uh, you know, people being susceptible to, to addiction or, you know, being taken, taken down. Yeah. So we have to take a step back and then we have to see why people become addicted and mm -hmm. people become addicted for a variety of reasons. Some become addicted because they have co-occurring psychiatric illnesses or pain illnesses or, or uh, others become addicted because they had a well-paying middle class job uh, and they were somebody in their community. They had a role. Now that's gone. And now they're nobody. They have no role. And so that could be hard. They can get in trouble with drugs or something else. Uh, others are, are just simply not as responsible. And then as they develop, they may become more responsible and they can handle their drug use. So people become addicted for a variety of reasons. And so once you doesn't fit off, if we're worried about people becoming addicted, it's not the drug. If the vast majority of the people who use a drug are not becoming addicted, that tells you it's not the drug, it's these other factors. So you make sure people have well-paying jobs or uh, they are gainfully em employed. They can take care of their families. You make sure their uh, psychiatric illnesses are taken care of. That is, you make sure they have health care. You make sure they, have, they are educated so they understand something about uh, how to develop these responsibility skills. You make sure that the community is taken care of. All of the things that we have scapegoated drugs so we don't have to do it. 
That's what politicians do. It do. That's why the issue of drugs or the war on drugs, it's a wet dream for politicians because all they have to say is that we're going to put more cops on the streets, and you know, um, then that that creates some jobs for a select group of people, typically um, uh, white. Uh, guys who have limited education and, and then their jobs are predicated on largely incarcerating black and brown bodies. That's which is another it. which is another profit center. That's it. So what in effect the war on drugs is a jobs jobs programs and we knew we know this well, every most people know this who are like thinking about this sort of thing uh it's not about drugs it's about creating jobs for a select group of people it's about subjugating another group of people and it's it has been effective for oh at least 40 years now in our country um and so it's not about drugs so let's not confuse that yeah i mean that the in thinking about it I can tell you my my point of view for what it's worth uh, is what you're talking about is a fairly uh, people, especially on the right, would call it utopian, right? A a robust social services net of of just so of safety, whether it's health care, mental health care, et cetera, et cetera. And and they're saying like we can't, you know. Uh, legalize drugs until we get all that stuff squared away. So therefore, we can't legalize drugs. But who says that? Who says that? Well, well, no. I th well, that's my argument against you, right? Against the thing of like you're talking about a utopian society, but in the meantime, they're incarcerating the only the, the real victims of this are black and brown people. So it's it's they're holding up this thing of like, well, we can't because we can't have. We're not going to be able to get rid of all these comorbidities, so to speak, in terms of people getting addicted. So we we shouldn't do it. It's just a precautionary measure. And it's like, yeah, but in the meantime, go fuck yourself because black and brown, largely men, are the victims of this. Yeah, I don't know if they're even going as far as you said. Um, I think they stopped at this issue of we'll put more cops on the streets and people support that. That's it. Right. No, yeah, uh, I don't think I'm just playing it out yeah. in terms of like if they even if they heard the argument, then they go, well, what you're saying, Carl, is that in order to allow drugs, you know, uh, uh, to be openly for sale, we'd have to really make sure everybody was right mentally and physically and 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 that's just too big a uh the cost of that is too big the, the, I, and that's I don't the think they're saying that. elected saying i'm gonna take cops off the street maybe i don't think they're saying that i think what they're saying is that these drugs are too dangerous that's what they're saying and that is uh not true um every year in our laboratories at Columbia University, we give thousands of doses of these drugs to people and study the effects. Now, if these drugs were so dangerous, why are researchers around the country allowed to give these drugs to American citizens? And they're doing so um, as a result of taxpayer dollars that support this type of research. So that's just, that's just not true. But I think that's what they're saying, that these drugs are so dangerous it's just not true i can tell you if they listen to your argument their next argument is going to be it's well you're talking about a robust social safety net net and uh, we can't we don't do we're not we're not sweden all that shit. um because that's the only my only argument against it is like you've got a lot of people that are sort of in dire straits physically emotionally psychologically and not all people can take drugs on the other hand weed i live two block block and a half away from a weed store and i'm i it's not a problem because i don't like weed neil check it out this is very simple what if we just say we won't arrest anybody anymore for drug use and we're not going to make it legal, but we won't be arresting people. We're not going to be putting our citizens behind bars for what they put in their bodies, what they are guaranteed in the Declaration of Independence. Just that. What if we did that? Great. I mean, that's what, you know, I, to your point, I don't think anything, 
I don't think any of the stats would change other than incarceration. What stats? So you mean like fatalities, death. violence around it, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I, I, the violence around drugs uh, is a result of the law enforcement pressure and right. intensity. That's not that has nothing to do with drugs. That has everything to do with the uh, the economy and the pressure from the law enforcement. So we have to keep that uh, yeah. separated. So if we decrease the law enforcement sort of pressure, you don't get that violence. That's that's not that's a simple sort of thing. Now, the concern that I have is it, that if the government doesn't step in and regulate the market be, uh, for quality control, then you still have this issue of tainted drug. That's right. my major concern. And so what well, the government can say, well, we're going to implement drug checking services so people can test their substances. And that way we can deal with some of the sort of adulterants, these uh, dangerous substances that people who are seek who are using drugs are not seeking to use. Great. Let's do that. I mean, we can do we can do this in a gradual way. Um, that's fine. Um, but let's have an adult conversation about doing it in a rational way uh, about uh, protecting our citizens. And what is the what are the the results in Brazil and uh, Portugal are pretty overwhelmingly positive. I mean, it's like, yes. I think it a lot of it's a lot of it is the same. It's just a lot of America's you know skittishness or reluctance around drugs is just it's all that religion shit it's all tied into that yeah it's our puritanical sort of way of seeing the world and that is uh our concern that somebody somewhere is having fun and that's that's our that's the real issue you know and um but i again implore people to read the declaration of independence if you call yourself an american it guarantees us. Carl, we're not here to sell the Declaration of Independence. No. We're here to sell drug use for grown-ups. Adulthood. Adulthood. By Carl Hart. <laughs> you got, man, you keep fucking with this Declaration of Independence. I'm telling you. <laughs> you need to shut the fuck up. Um, unless you got a piece of it. Uh, yeah. Um, so, and how do you feel... I mean, I, I, I will say that the thing that, that's helped with drugs and and certainly weed and now uh cybacillin and and a little and and uh and mdma and our scientists and it it is testing and it is you know how quickly it goes from especially with weed from absolutely not to yeah open a store yeah, yeah, I don't think I don't think science has played much of a role there. Maybe a little, but not much. I the reason why we have 15 states now that have legalized marijuana for adult recreational use is because of the loot, because of the money. Right. Uh, people are seeing Colorado, Washington uh, generate uh, this tax revenue, and so they're like, we need to get in on this, and that that's yeah. why. And what are the stats in Portugal in terms of overdoses, et cetera, et cetera? And they have, you know, they give needles. Yeah. They do all like the reasonable stuff. Yeah. I mean, if we think about overdoses from heroin or some opioid uh, in, in Portugal, I believe it's like six in 100 citizens. In the United States, uh, I mean, six in like uh, 1,000. Uh, in the United States, uh, six in 100,000. And in the United States, there's something like 320 per 100,000. Um, so you can see the rate in the United States is far higher than the rate uh, in Portugal. Um, and so when the drug is not stigmatized, people can seek help, people can seek advice, people can get education about how to do these things without putting themselves in risk at risk. Um, all the things that we're not doing in this country. And do you see progress? Uh, with the weed, yeah. Uh, like you pointed out, uh, uh, we now have a number of states that have legalized marijuana for adult, adult consumption. Uh, this last election, uh, Oregon voted to decriminalize all drugs. That is, they voted to behave like Portugal. They will no longer arrest people for using drugs whether it's heroin, whether it's cocaine, whether it's methamphetamine, whether it's MDMA, 
Um, that's a significant step. Uh, we'll see what happens in the other states. Uh, the South, in the South, we, be, we have been slow. Um, like you don't have a marijuana legal state in terms of recreational marijuana. You don't have a legal Southern state in part because, um, I believe based, uh, what I think is that, uh, uh marijuana, uh, it functions as such an important, uh, probable cause for the police mm -hmm. such that you can say you smell weed and now you can harass people. You can, um, uh, search people. Uh, but when you're in a legal marijuana state, the fact that you smell weed, okay. Uh, it's legal. Um, uh, but in the South, they have been slow to um, embrace uh, marijuana legalization. And I think it's driven primarily uh, from law enforcement. Yeah. Well, you can you explain um, how governments use drug criminalization to control different groups? And then they've been doing it for 120 years. Yes. Yeah, when we think about like why something like cocaine is illegal, uh, we go back to the late 1800s. Uh, cocaine uh, was uh, introduced in this country through products like uh, Coca-Cola. Uh, but before Coca-Cola, uh, there was a product called Coca Wine. And the guy who did it was John Pendleton in Atlanta. And um, he introduced it, I believe, in 1884, 1885 or so. Also, Atlanta banned alcohol, so he had to take the alcohol out of his concoction and he had to replace it with something. So he added carbonated water and sugar. Voila, we got cocaine uh, and cocaine was sold in fountains and only white people could um, frequent these uh, fountains. So cocaine was only available to white folks uh, in Atlanta and regions of the South. Uh, and Coca-Cola decided that they can make more money by bottling this. Now black people had access to cocaine that upset some white folks. And so they started to, uh, uh, wed, uh, bad behavior with black folks and cocaine use, which it was all, uh, fabricated and concocted and lies. Uh, but all of this, uh, these stories like black men raping white women or black men being so high on cocaine that you uh, could unload your six revolver uh, and they wouldn't drop. Uh, and, and they and they and then the cops said we need higher caliber bullets to stop these raging coked up Negroes. Absolutely. So Southern police moved away from the 32 caliber weapon to the 38 caliber weapon in order to stop these coconized cocaine uh, black folks. Uh, eventually, 1914, uh, Congress bans um, uh, cocaine and opioid related products. The first time we had national drug laws, uh, a law that banned drugs, it was, uh, it was uh, an incredible step and one that was uh, uh, unexpected. Uh, but uh, when you have uh, the, uh, when you marry or wed bad behavior by black people with some activity, it becomes easier to uh, pass the law. So cocaine is banned, not because of pharmacology, but because of American racism. And similar things happen with marijuana and Mexican immigrants. Absolutely. Right? And then, it, and it was, it went cocaine, opium, weed, right? In right. In terms of so who cocaine, they were going to target. That's right. So cocaine and op opioid related products were banned at the same time. Um, and of course, the opioid related products were uh, wedded uh, to the Chinese because uh, we didn't like the Chinese in this country. And so we vilified them. And, and so we got, what, uh, two birds with one stone in, in, in the 1914 law. Uh, and then by 1937, we, we uh, said that Mexicans and Black folks using weed were misbehaving. And that essentially led to the banning of, of, of marijuana. Uh, all of these drugs are banned, not because of pharmacology, but because of American racism. Yeah. Um... And that's, by the way, all that's in your other book, High Price, right? Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's somewhere in my writings. That's right. Somewhere. Uh, you know, I've read so much, Carl. Um, the, um, and how, oh, okay, here's a question. How did your, what was your thought process on, I found your coming out journey kind of interesting. 
as a coming out as a as a uh, you know a tenured professor coming out as a like you li- you were you were just lying about it like everybody everybody lies about drugs and then at a certain point you were just like I can't do this anymore. That's right. Can you, you know, talk about that? Yeah. So like you point out, I've been all around the world, and so uh, I've seen people from folks in Belfast. Folks in Manila, Philippines, folks in Bogota, uh, folks in South Africa, all around the world. And I see people who are identified as drug users and they have no choice uh, and they are persecuted. They are vilified. They are vilified and persecuted for the very same thing that I and so many other people are doing. Uh, so when I go to these other countries and I, even in the United States, uh, I've gotten high with people who are in government people who are famous, people who are captains of industry, all in the closet. Meanwhile, these people are being vilified and they're catching hell. And so what kind of man would I be in the face of this carnage? Um, Remain silent. I mean, uh, it's inconsistent with all of my heroes. They all stood up when there was great risk to themselves. And so it's like, um, I'm just trying to live like the man that I think I am. And, you know, I still fall short in places, but here I'm trying to do that. And did you discuss it with your wife? That kind of thing? Like, hey, I'm going to do this. Did you do you think you could lose your job? Did you think you could lose your job? Did you run it by anybody? No, of course, my wife and my kids. uh, Yeah, of course, they, you know, uh, we've been honest about all kinds of things. So this was this was not a what's not a big deal. I mean, when you have like black kids like me, you were raised in a country like in the United States, and and they present images of jolly Saint Nick's or uh, Santa Claus, and so that's the person that they say is bringing your kids gifts. So our kids are very young. We have to sit them down and say like, hold up, hold up, this is nonsense. You know, uh, no jolly white guys bringing you gifts. I'm bringing you gifts. All of this sort of nonsense that happens in this society. We have to be forthright with our kids. And this is just another sort of extension of that forthrightness. So this is not a big, this is not a big deal. Now, in terms of thinking about other people, I don't really, you know, it's not really anybody's business. Um, uh, as long as I treat people well, and as long as I do my job, um, I don't expect to have any problems. Why would I? Well, I don't, I legally, what's the, are you protected? Can you say as a tenured professor at Columbia, I do drugs sometimes? I do technically illegal drugs? Um, legally, can you say that um, I exceeded the speed limit? I broke the law. Right. What, what will happen? Will they fire you for that? I mean, this is a similar sort of thing. I mean, or if you say, well, I had premarital sex in Virginia. Right. Uh, you broke the law. I mean, so are you fired because of that? Because yeah. in Virginia, uh, that's against the law. Yeah. Uh, what do you make of, while we're on the subject, what do you make of uh, drug testing uh, at workplaces? Um, drug testing at workplaces, it's a, it's a violation of the Fifth Amendment, is what I think. Um, it would be interesting if somebody does something about it. It's like uh, the Fifth Amendment protects us from self-incrimination. And um, the major thing is that people should be looking at people's behavior. Are people doing their job? Are they screwing up? If they are screwing up, then you may have just cause to do take action. But if people are uh, doing their job, meeting their obligations, why are you messing with them? They are, again, enjoying the rights guaranteed in the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. I mean, you know, what's funny is when I told people about the book and I said, I show them you, you, whatever, interviews of you or whatever, and, uh, and, and people go like, yeah, he seems sleepy. And it's like, <laughs> wait a minute. You're, so what I want to say is you're, you're like... Uh, you can be the standard bearer of a guy who occasionally does heroin, meth, um, MDMA, and but you're still hyper intelligent. You're still all the things that people strive to be. And anything else is like, well, that's just who you are as a guy. I don't, 
I don't think that any of these drugs are having a uh, an effect on your behavior outside of a 12 hour window tops. Neil, check it out, man. Um, I will put my record up against anybody's record in terms of productivity, in terms of how you've done with your kids, uh, in terms of your contribution that you've made to a society. Uh, put my record up against anybody's record, and um, let's see where the chips fall. Well, that's what I. Well, that's what I mean. Do, do you feel, in some ways, that you uh, have to be like an officer? of your movement do you, well, I mean, you know what i mean yeah i do i feel you man I, I feel you but check this out i'm a black professor at an ivy league institution four percent of our professors are black that pressure is already there right yeah. i'm a black man in america trying to move through academe that pressure is already there so this kind of nonsense is like give me a break yeah it's light work yeah um and how has the, oh God. So, um, <laughs> so oh I just God. wanted to remind you that we have questions from the audience. I don't know, yeah, Neil, we didn't have a chance to talk, but maybe you want to grab some of those and ask them. Some of these are, as well. the ones I've seen are very uh, <laughs> like prescriptive. Okay. Which I don't know if you want to get into, but one says, can psilocybin and cannabis be used effectively to treat OCD? I've read a lot of conflicting opinions and studies, but it's difficult to tell what is based on evidence with no bias and what is not. Yeah, I, I, I'm not aware of any studies looking at psilocybin for OCD. Psilocybin certainly has been shown to decrease people's uh, smoking behavior. Like if they want to quit tobacco smoking, it's been shown to do that sort of thing. Uh, but I'm not aware of the OCD uh, evidence. Fair enough. Here's a good one. Uh, can you describe your experience convincing other academics in joining you in coming out of the closet on their recreational drug use? Have you had some success? If not, can you describe some of the challenges you face in getting more fellow scientists on board? Uh, I have not tried to convince people. People sometimes send me emails and say they're with me and they're coming out of the closet or what have you. But that's not my target audience. My tar target audience is the people. I'm trying to enhance the education among the people because the people will ultimately, ultimately decide where we go, not academics. The people will decide. Um, very good. Um, I think Jelani Cobb, I think you go after him next. Um, a, a One of the 4% at Columbia. Uh, <laughs> 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 Four percenters. Uh, can you expand more on the regulation of drugs and drug markets? Does that mean that we should sell, for example, fentanyl in shops? Tell them about fentanyl because what you told me was interesting. What part did what? what you know well, that, how long it's been around? Oh, yeah, that's cool. Um, so, um, first of all, if people had access to heroin, most people will not wouldn't choose to take fentanyl. Heroin's sort of euphoria is slightly more than uh, the fentanyl. And certainly uh, it has a, a, a safer uh, dosing window. Um, and fentanyl has been available medically since the 1960s. And we use fentanyl in, in medicine. Uh, we even have fentanyl lollipops for children, for example, who who have cancer-related severe pain. Um, and so fentanyl is an important medication that we use. Uh, it's only got this bad name recently because people are getting fentanyl unbeknownst to them. And then that can be, that can be a problem, of course. Yeah, the, I think reiterating your point about most overdoses, most bad outcomes are based on uh, a lack of information or a pre-existing condition in the person. Absolutely. Well, that's got to be around 90%, right? I mean, it's just they don't know what they're taking. And like the importance of sleep. Like you, you said something about one of the problems is not these drugs in and of themselves. But if you don't sleep for three or four days, you're getting psychosis whether you took meth or candy. Absolutely. Sleep is uh, one of the most important sort of human functions. If you don't get uh, sufficient sleep, you won't perform well. And you might even have some psychosis if you go for extended periods without sleep. Uh, oftentimes we conflate, confuse drug effects for 
lack of sleep effect or even nutrition. It's important to make sure you eat. Um, so I do all of those things. I work out, eat well, sleep well, uh, all of those things. Um, and again, to the misinformation campaign, what you said about the bath salts in Florida thing. Yes. It was kind of, I mean, it shouldn't surprise me, but I could. I, I, yeah, talk to, tell the people. Well, uh, this is a Miami event. And so people might know uh, back in 2012, I believe, uh, when uh, we had this, uh, these media reports saying that uh, somebody took bad salts and ate the face off of another person. Uh, and the media p reports, they ran with this. But when the toxicology of the perpetrator uh, came back, uh, the perpetrator did not have any bad salts in their system. The only thing they had in their system was a little bit of marijuana, which suggested that the person did not use marijuana, uh, certainly not on that day and maybe for several days prior to this attack. Uh, but in the media, that story, the complete story was never told. Uh, in fact, some people still say bath salts caused that attack, uh, even though bath salts were not nowhere involved with that, that, uh, that attack. They weren't, yeah, they just were not, it was made up. It was made up from some uh, cop on the scene. Uh, he talked to the media first. And then there was this guy in the ER, I believe at Jackson Memorial Hospital. He kind of uh, bolstered that story or reinforced that story with some other nonsense that he said. And the story took on a life of his own. Uh, somebody has a question. How can we better educate uh, about the synergistic effect to the general public what is the synergistic effect is that I, what we're talking about i don't understand the question well good and if you don't what how do you think i feel <laughs> i'm um, sorry i just don't don't understand it um uh okay if you were appointed to a public office what office would it be to put some of your common sense solutions into effect i that is i mean the, the big question is how do you if if it if any of this stuff if any minds change, if any laws change, how do you see it happening? Or you uh, didn't so even think that? The question was, was related to like a public office. I have no desire to be in a public office. Um, I enjoy being honest and I, I enjoy being unfettered. Uh, and so a public office would probably try to hamper my honesty. And I can't get down with that one. And then you say, how does change happen? I, I really don't know, you know, change something, you know, people think it happens in these incremental sort of stage. It typically, it doesn't, it just happens. And so I can't be too concerned with that. All I can be concerned with is being honest and telling the truth as I see it uh, after having studied drugs for this long. Um, and so um, that's all I can do. I can only just try and be as truthful as I can. Yeah. There's a question here. Someone says, uh, I work in overdose prevention in Canada and the U.S. Many people working in public health believe in what you're talking about, but are stuck working within the confines of these ridiculous laws. How would you recommend people advocate for things like legalization, safe supply? Uh, this is their biggest pain point. Yeah, you know, in the book, one of the things that I try to give people uh, to do that everyone can do there are millions, tens of millions of Americans who are in the closet about their drug use. And the vast majority of these people are responsible. They are paying their taxes. They're taking care of their families. They're happy. They are important people in their communities. Come out of the closet so we can change this view, this warped view, this inaccurate view of a drug user. And then so we wouldn't have to have ridiculous adolescent conversations about drugs. So people wouldn't have to say you use heroin as if that is as if that is the measure of me, the man. And that's that's like saying you have sex, you had an orgasm. Come on. I think, well, I do judge people on whether they had an orgasm or not, Carl. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, uh, Oh, I also wanted to point out after people buy the book, there's a very good, I think how I came to know who you, maybe I, I don't know how, but in, in the documentary, um, the house I live in, uh, it's by Eugene Jarecki and it's just a very wide scope 
documentary about not so much legalization, but the futility of the war on drugs. Yeah. Um, which you illuminate as well, but in case you want a, a second, second dose, as it were. Yeah. Um, we have, the thing there is that it's easy to say the war on drugs is bad. That's an easy thing. Liberals love that kind of thing. The, 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 the hard part is to say, uh, to look at the assumptions on which the, drug, the war on drugs are built. And they are built on this nonsense assumption that these drugs are so dangerous, we have to restrict them. And that, that's where people have a problem. And if you're going to say the war on drugs then it's, a, it's, it's bad, then it's incumbent upon you to take, to take that next step, to find out what are the assumptions on which it's built. And that's what I'm trying to help people to understand. And the two, I mean, it's racism and puritanism, correct? Uh, it's based on this assumption that drugs are so bad, we have to keep them away from our society. That's the major assumption. And people, even liberals, buy into that. And so if you buy into that, then you're going to have a war on drugs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what if they ended the war? I guess what I was saying earlier about Portugal Portugal has no war on drugs. They, it's a uh, no. They don't. They don't consider it any different than anything else in their society, right? Most civilized countries don't have this nonsense war on drugs. Um, uh, you go to Canada. There's not a war on drugs. I mean, uh, this is a uh, this is an American thing, and this is a strong man sort of thing. Countries that have dictators and strong men, yeah, they have wars on drugs because it's a tool by which they can control the population. And also, we all know the, the, the origin of the war on drugs, when you hear that tape, is just like hitting hippies and black people, right? Yeah, Nixon is, is credited with saying the war on drugs, but Nixon's war on drugs was really mild compared to George Bush one's war on drugs compared to uh, Bill Clinton's war on drugs compared to Barack Obama's war on drugs. Nixon was mild. That's what that was nothing. Right. Uh, uh, so but the war on drugs in the U.S. started really in 1914 when we banned cocaine and opioids. Um, all right. Question. Overdose. Um. Is there a drug that helps weaken an alcohol dependency? There is, right? Um, there are drugs that are approved to help uh, alcohol dependency. Uh, Long-term uh, naltrexone, a long-acting naltrexone, um, uh, a camprosate is used, and the older one, uh, antabuse or dosulfiram. Uh, those three drugs are approved to treat alcohol dependence. This is a separate question, but... Do you think it's just market forces that that the fact that no one knows about those drugs? Do you think it's just pure because al I always say alcohol is the most destructive substance on earth. Like it's not close when you look at the stats. Um, half of the people that are that commit crime have are drunk. Uh, sexual assaults, it's over 50 percent reported like it. None of it's good. Um and so, so do you have a, what's your feeling about alcohol? Is it, do you put it in the same category as everything else? Am I? Yeah, being, alcohol, uh, alcohol is a drug, just like anything else. Um, the important thing to keep in mind as we think about alcohol and some of the, the horrors that happen under intoxic during intoxication is that the vast majority of drinkers don't engage in any of that sort of misbehavior when they drink. Just a small percentage of folks uh, do. And so the question becomes, do we vilify or ban alcohol because a small percentage of individuals in our society have a problem with the drug? And we have answered it emphatically, no, we don't ban alcohol because that small percentage of people have a problem when they drink. The same is true with those people who get in car accidents, who drive reckless, recklessly. We don't ban cars. We engage in um, uh, uh, remedial uh, uh, um, methods to try to enhance the safety of those activities. And that's what we should do with these other drugs. 
Uh, we have seat belts, speed limits. Uh, we require people to be a certain age to pass a, a test before they can drive. All of those sort of things, those requirements help to enhance the safety of driving, but we don't ban driving. We have chosen to ban drugs like heroin uh, without uh, uh, doing those other things, like trying to enhance the safety of the activity. We certainly can do that. Yeah, I mean, I would I would argue the problem with alcohol is uh, largely about dosage. Meaning if you look at the science on alcohol, around 18 to 22 ounces is like the sweet spot. And no one does that. 18 to 20 ounces of what? Vodka uh, or a beer? Uh, say again. Vodka? That contains like. Well, now, I mean, look, if you want to be scientific about it, you know, I'm not, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. But um, look, Carl, I was trying to speak your language, but I tried to meet you halfway. Lesson learned. Won't, do, won't make that mistake again. Uh, somebody else said, uh, I dealt with cluster headaches for a decade and a half. Cybacillin is well known in that community as a cure. I myself have experienced zero attacks since I started shrooming. Every other month, a few years back, I spent years of legal, on legal drugs that had zero effect on my condition. Do we know why psilocybin seems to be so effective on disorders like mine? Once a year, I take heroic doses of half an ounce, uh, and I've experienced uh, bad trips, but even those experiences resulted in positive changes in my life. Yeah, uh, uh, psilocybin certainly has been shown in limited studies to uh, reduce uh, those cluster headaches. Uh, there are no cures for this cluster headache thing, but it it certainly treats it. Um, I don't know why. Uh, we don't know why, um, but it certainly has been shown in some some studies, limited studies, to be effective. All right, very good. Um, and. Uh... Well, here's a question. How do you, how would you, have you been pleased with the reception of the book? Yeah, I, I've been ecstatic. It's been great. Um, people have actually read the book and, and grappled with the arguments. Um, uh, they've gotten beyond the sort of uh, controversial sort of sensationalistic thing that we, that happens in the media and they just struggle with the arguments. And that's the thing. That's all one can ask is that people struggle with the arguments and take the arguments ser seriously. And so I've been I've been ecstatic. Great. Um, you know what you brought up in the book that we didn't speak about is the uh, the child services argument. Yes. About which I think is really a a, a relevant. It, it was one of those things that it's, I never it had never occurred to me. Can you talk about that for a second? I'm just gonna walk away. Yeah. Um, in the book, I talked about um, these mothers who test positive for something like. Uh, cannabis in their urine and then they have their children taken away uh by uh ch child services and um just for testing positive for something like cannabis even though the parent the mother um uh is a uh, has been a good mother um handling her responsibilities as a mother but the mere fact that uh THC was in the woman's urine uh, was enough to have uh, the child taken away. And um, uh, that's like saying that somebody tested positive for a beer and we're going to take away their children. It's um, it doesn't make much sense. When I'm mayor, it will make sense. You'll <laughs> see. You'll all see. Um, did you. To that. Well, that's the thing of, of just the punish. It's it's how the punishment always ends up being on poor people that are darker than a, than a, than a lunch bag. Like it, it always ends up just being, it's, it's, it's like a weird Rube Goldberg that always goes back to that somehow. Yeah. Your comment, uh, Mira's, uh, comments that James Baldwin said uh, in December uh, 1986, when the country passed these laws that punished crack cocaine violations a hundred times more harshly than powder cocaine violations. Uh, and that resulted into, uh, I mean, how it played out is small amounts of cracks 
resulted into uh, a minimum of five years in prison, whereas 100 times more powder cocaine would have been needed to trigger the same sentence. James Baldwin said that um, at the press club in 1986, December, that these laws, in effect, can only be used against the poor and poor black people especially is what he said. And that has that has come to be the case. And you just said exactly what Baldwin observed back in 1986. The problem was nobody was listening. Well, what's funny is you kind of said you weren't either, right? Of course, I wasn't listening. I was 20 years old in 1986 and I had drank the Kool-Aid. I was you down heard the quote like this mother. You were kind of like who like exactly. I, I was like, wait, Pee Pee Wee Herman didn't say that. Pee Wee Herman said that crack was like putting a, a a gun in your mouth and pulling the trigger. Nancy Reagan wasn't saying that. So I had drank the Kool-Aid and I was uh just like most of America believing that. Um yeah, that's it's 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 wild. Um the let me see if I can find any other questions. Uh, oh, this is a good one. Are there any drugs you are against no matter what? Are there any drugs I'm against? I, I don't understand what that means. I'm, is there I, anything that you'll be like, under no circumstances would I ever do? I don't even know what, what's left for you. Wait. We should understand that. Like when I'm, If I'm going to take a drug, it's to seek a certain effect. And right. so if the drug produced the effect that I'm seeking and it does it better than something else, that's the drug that I will take. Um, and so it's not this sort of adolescent thing. Uh, I'm, oh, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try that. That's I'm 54 years old. I don't life's too short for that for me. Uh, right. That's not what I do. It's also. I mean, I think the the drugs that you say are it's it's the analogs are is where the problems are right meaning you talk about in the book about the uh, what's the the it's like an analog to weed spice or something k2 spice that's right uh those drugs are uh can be far more dangerous than uh, cannabis itself and so in places where cannabis is banned you sometimes see people seeking to get a cannabis high and they're taking something like spice k2 and they get in trouble. Uh, like a thing that they were selling at the at bodegas, right? That's right. The thing that they sell the sell at bodegas, um, and people just seeking a cannabis high. And these uh, oftentimes they're a lot more potent than THC, and people don't know that, and they take too much, and then they have these negative effects. They can pass out all of these negative effects, and uh, but people are seeking cannabis because cannabis works for what they want, and you don't need these other things as a result. Yeah, and that's be, so it's like a thing, a wall is put up by the government. That's right. People go around and the thing that they can get their hands on is worse than the thing that the government was trying to protect them from. Exactly. The thing that people are seeking, things like cocaine, heroin, all of these drugs have been with us for more than 100 years, more than that in, in many of these cases. Uh, these drugs, we understand some things about them. We know how to use them. We understand things about dosing. Uh, we have all this experience. We know how to enhance the positive effects while, minim while minimizing the negative effects. Uh, and we are uh, ignoring all of this knowledge and banning these substances. And so people now are seeking those effects, but they use these new substances that they don't have as much knowledge uh, about. And as a result, you have some problems with that. Uh, somebody said, what does Dr. Carl Hart think of Bruce Alexander's rat park experiment? Um, I think the world of Bruce Alexander's rat park experiments. Uh, in fact, uh, I talked about it quite a book in my last book, High Price. Yeah. I, I like Bruce Alexander. Can you tell what, what, the, what, what the experiment is? Uh, yeah, thank you, Neil. Uh, uh, Bruce Alexander uh, did some experiments back in the 70s where he uh, raised a group of rats in desolate, barren conditions and another group of rats in uh, enriched environments such that they had other rats, uh, play toys, uh, other treats. Uh, and then he gave these rats an opportunity to take morphine. The rats that were uh, raised in the barren, desolate condition 
they took far more morphine than the rats that were raised in the enriched environments. And so um, uh, that told us that uh, when we think about drug addiction, that was a clue that drug addiction has a lot to do with these environmental conditions under which the drug is taken. Yeah, and that's kind of your whole premise is, that's is it. like just if we're all reasonable about this, we That's can in, we can have a we can have a more connected we can have better lives. Absolutely, uh, there are a number of people who are enjoying those better lives. I mean, like for example, you talked about how hard it would be to make sure people had health care and all of these things, make sure that their psychiatric illnesses were taken care of. We have that. We call it the military. The military yeah. has all of it. We guarantee this for those citizens in the military. It's just that the civilians don't have that unless you are um, uh, you have a, a well-paying job. And, and that's becoming more and more difficult with Corona. Uh, but we already do it in our military. And and ex-military, right? Like if you're retired. If you're retired. You're VA. All right. If you've done 20 years, you have it, too. Absolutely. Right. Well, again, what they're going to say is, yeah, but have you seen the VA? It's a mess. Da, da, da. And it's like, right, that's fine. But in the meantime, why do black and brown men need to take in and, and women, as you pointed out with the child services thing, need to take all of the punishment because you can't figure out that simple shit. Relatively simple shit. I mean, yeah, not- um, we don't care about the people who are suffering. Uh, as a result of these awful po- uh, uh, policies. Uh, those people, uh, we value them less. That's why we do what we do. Right. Just racism. Racism, classism, um, poor white people are, are getting their ass kicked too. Um, it's all of that mixed in one, but they uh, uh, they they pretend that these folks are all on their side, but they're get, they're getting killed as well. And what do you think, what do you see happening with the, quote, opioid, quote, epidemic? Um, How do you see it playing out? uh, I, when people say I could, uh, epidemic, I just want to make sure we're talking. So people think about addiction rates, they think about overdose rates. Um, uh, If we want to stem the tide of opioid, uh, uh, of just drug-related overdose deaths, we can simply implement these drug checking services where people can submit small samples of their substance, find out the chemical constituents and get a printout and education on what is in the substance. Then they can decide whether to take it or not. That will go a long way in dealing with that concern. In terms of addiction rates, uh, we can make sure we have a healthier society. Make sure people have health care. Just do that. Uh, That would go a long way in taking care of those problems. Make sure people have some employment that's uh, that will pay a a decent living wage. That will go a long way in dealing with any of this sort of opioid so-called crisis thing. If you just take care of those fundamental things. To your point, someone could technically eat. uh, I keep saying eat, eat. (laughs) They could take opioids every day, right? Uh, people do take opioids every day. As you know, uh, from the book, I have pointed out, um, I worked in this clinic in Switzerland for a little bit where they gave heroin to people who met criteria for heroin addiction twice a day, every day. Um, and these people, most of them worked. Uh, they all had housing. They had a social worker, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a uh, uh, primary care physician, uh, they had all of these sorts of things, and they were happy. The overwhelming majority of them were happy. So people do take opioids every day and yeah. are productive members of their society and are happy. And it's not an epidemic of death. It's not an epidemic of crime. It's not a, if you can afford if you have a, if you can afford opioids. If so, like it, it, this presupposes that the drugs are priced fairly. All that you have enough, you make a decent living. All that stuff. But none of these drugs are intrinsically deadly. No, that's that's not how it works. Um, uh, The danger or the sort of positive effects of a drug, uh, the dangers are enhanced or the positive effects are enhanced depending on the psychosocial or the environmental conditions. That's how that's how we determine whether or not a drug becomes dangerous. If we're only looking at the drug, then we are behind the eight ball. 
Right. I mean, I just think it's I. The, you were the first person that ever made me realize, like, oh, I remember that that oh, uh, drugs don't kill you. Just cocaine itself will not kill you under any. I mean, not under no circumstances, but it would be it would it would be a long shot. It would be a long shot if you had cocaine and not other stuff. Um, that cocaine would like kill you um, unless you are. You've taken like a tremendous amount that you're trying to do yourself in. But no, uh, it's it's not the easiest thing to do. I mean, we give thousands of doses of crack cocaine every year in our laboratories. We've never seen anything like that. Yeah, uh, this is a decent question. What percentage of the U.S. population roughly would you say meets the criteria for responsible drug use in the book? Do you have any interest in exploring potential benefits of drug use for people who fall outside the criteria, i.e., do you think it's uh, possible for recreational drugs to improve someone's ability to meet their adult obligations? Uh, the last There's three big questions. Yeah, yeah, the last question, do I think like somebody using drugs could, could help them meet their obligation? Yeah, I think the Switzerland example shows that those people are getting heroin every day and they have these other things and they are their lives have been approved as a result. So yeah. I think a better example of it is you. Uh, Yeah. If you need to write, sometimes you'll, you'll have some meth. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, our society in general, uh, people take caffeine in the morning. That's drug use in order to be alert and uh, energetic for whatever activity. Absolutely. Of course, drugs can enhance um, um, these activities. Uh, That's what I was trying to show in the book. But every time I have to deal with these issues related to like, what about this? What about that? Um, um, And so uh, that's where I spend most of my time dealing with those issues. But I was trying to talk about the pleasures and the joys of being a grown up. Yeah. You see it as like a thing that you do, like uh, sex or uh, alcohol or a cigar or going or to see you perform, or going, or to, going see to see me. It is. They do say it's the greatest high on earth is going to see me. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, just a pleasurable thing that doesn't have to be a rampage. No one's jumping out windows. No one's biting face. Like that's almost without fail. That's never the drug itself. That's exactly right. Uh, let me just give you an analogy. You know, like sometimes when I, if I do something like MDMA and then I do it with my wife or what have you, uh, it's a great sort of moment, great opportunity, great time to connect, to uh, reset, to recalibrate, to evaluate our life, what we've been doing. And uh, we have new insights. I went to see when I see you, uh, the some joke you might have said got me to rethink about the uh, right uh, cocaine. How we think about cocaine. You said uh, you had a really funny joke about uh, what people they're not talking about um, uh, restricting an abortion when they do cocaine or some. You had this great joke. Right. Got me to rethink how I think about some things. The same is true with drugs. I it helps me to recalibrate and think about my own actions and my own beliefs, and that's exactly the same thing. Yeah, and it's not. I want to correct the joke because uh, it sounds like how could that have ever been funny? Uh, it's uh, it's Republicans always advocate for the war on drugs because no one's ever done drugs and become more Republican. Um, and then the guy smoking a joint says, uh, "We should, we should uh, open up women's reproductive rights." Um, no one's or I, whatever. You get it. You can figure out the comedy. Uh, you froze. You froze laughing at a joke, which if you're going to die again, oh, there you come back. Um, uh, okay. Uh, really curious about Dr. Hart's opinion on the new Netflix documentary he's featured in. It seems to demonize the drug in a way you are against. Uh, I love that person who made that comment. Um, thank you for paying (laughs) attention. Um, you hit it on the head uh, when we do things like documentary films and you're asked to be in them. You don't know what the filmmaker is going to say. Um, yeah. and so I had no editorial co- editorial control. Uh, but thank you for catching that. You're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Um, well, it's funny. I didn't even click on it. And somebody's like, oh, you're you're the Carl Hart's in that. And I was like, 
there's like literally fire on the poster. Like, it doesn't seem like <laughs> what, what you're advocating for. Um, here's one. Do you know anything about Delta 8 THC? It seems as though it's in the legal gray area and has been described as a weaker version of regular marijuana THC. Yeah, um, that I know about as much as you. It is in a legal gray area. It wasn't named in the ban, but since it's like THC, it might fall under the, uh, de- since it's like Delta 9 THC, it might fall under the ban. And in terms of the effects, uh, I know little about the effects. A little research has been done, certainly in humans, uh, w- uh, about the effects. And so, no, I'm, I'm fairly ignorant about Delta 8 uh, THC. Would that be... I mean, I, that's an analog, though, right? That's right. It's 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 actually in in the uh, plant, so it's not an analog. It's it's okay. just it's one of the constituents of the plant. Got it. Uh, somebody said, "What are your thoughts on the underground use of smart drugs around college and Silicon Valley?" Um, I didn't know it was underground. I thought people. Yeah, would be- I didn't either. Uh, but I, um, it's it's just what it is. It's always been that case, you know. Our um, our presidents, uh, our military, they all use drugs, uh, these so-called smart drugs, in order to be alert. Uh, they have these big jobs and they have to be up uh, for several consecutive hours. And so uh, it seems like a wise thing to do. And they've been doing it for uh, for some time. Uh, and um, yeah. yeah, a lot of these drugs are tested in the military, right? Some are tested in the military, um, uh, but probably not as much as people think. Um, but mil- the military has used amphetamines, uh, consistently since, uh, uh, the 1940s, 19, late 1930s. Yep. And we're still, and we still haven't won a war since 45. Anyhow, different discussion, different author. Um, should we educate children on drug use the same way we handle alcohol or caffeine and tell them it's for grown ups and they can make their choices when they are older? Uh, I wish we'd do a better job with alcohol. <laughs> um, and so uh, when we think about educating children for drugs, the, may, the drugs that children are most likely to take, um, alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis. Uh, and so we can just, uh, I think we should do a better job of uh, just telling them what the real sort of concerns are. Uh, like with cannabis, young, inexperienced users, uh, paranoia, anxiety, uh, could be even look like psychosis if you take too much. Uh, and you tell people, don't worry, just chill, uh, don't get too anxious. The drug will float away from the receptor, but just relax. So you talk people down with alcohol, you worry about alcohol poisoning, people taking too much and having respiratory depression, particularly inexperienced users. So you want to make sure people uh, understand the risk there. And tobacco, um, sucking, burning weeds like tobacco down your throat, just like cannabis in some cases. If you have asthma, uh, could be dangerous. So you just want people to understand what the real dangers are um and um and focus on the drugs that are more likely to be taken by young people what do you, can you just a- explain uh, we can all sort of deduce what respiratory depression is but can you talk about it a little more because how does the brain it's an autonomic thing that breathing right so how does it how does it yeah so like one of the things that alcohol can do is uh there are brain cells in the brain stem that is important for to help us breathe, and we don't we don't have to attend to it. Alcohol can suppress those uh, cells uh, such that uh, you stop breathing uh, because those cells are rendered uh, uh, inactive, uh, and you stop breathing. And so that could be that's a concern. Uh, hopefully, before people get there, uh, they would uh, vomit, and 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 so uh, there are protective mechanisms built in to try to uh, uh, ensure that that doesn't happen, but sometimes it happens. To get it out of your body. That's right. Um, How old are your children? My youngest is 20. Okay, and? And they, so they range from 37 to 20. And what do you tell them? When is, when do you kind of, as a parent, when, when is it, when are, what's your policy? Uh, what do you mean on drug use? Uh, I don't have a policy on drug use. I don't. Uh, the policy is that you are you make a contribution to your society, your community, 
do well. Uh, like when they were in school, their job was to do well. And, you know, we would deal with whatever came up when it came up, but it's not like some special policy. Um, I think that's silly. Um, um, that's not, we focus on the behavior that is most important. And that behavior is that they're doing well and contributing to their community. And that was so, if if you had, not like you're looking through pockets, but if your son was smoking weed at 14, how would you have felt about that? Oh, that that wouldn't that 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 doesn't happen. That wouldn't happen because that's like, um, like I don't think my son would have been ready for that sort of thing uh, at fourteen. And would you have? But so you would. So you believe in like, you know, not like an age, but maybe an age. Uh, yeah, maybe an age. Absolutely an age. You know, I think, for example, I think eighteen that that age in which you can go off to war. Uh, that age in which you can go to adult prison. I think that's an important age for people to be treated like adults. Um, before that, uh, uh, we have uh, we we have this sort of protective state for children. I think that's appropriate. And then after that, you just invest. You just hope that you taught them well. And no, I don't hope. Um, you know, I did the work, so I know I, that you know it's like. We act like this parent thing, this parenting thing is magic. It's not. It's work. And it's a, it's a lot of hard work and you have to be there. Um, and we put in the work and I don't want people to think like, um, oh, it's just magic. No, don't get it twisted. It was a lot of work. So when these people talk about my drug use or something, it's like, look at my products, my kids. Um, they're all doing well. And as, a, uh, you know, the ones I was there and, and it required work. Your product, it's it's Blue Magic. It's a brand name. Um, <laughs> the only five people know what I'm talking about. Uh, and what, when you say it's hard work, I, I know about like, you know, picking them up and dropping them off and all that stuff. But what do you, when you think of it, when you say hard work, what do you think? What do you, is it, what is it? Is it time? Just time spent, like, hours boots on the ground doing shit with them or is it what is what's most of the work of parenting and then i feel like we should wrap up <laughs> just because i i feel like i'm gonna like and then on page 205 you said like it was a fucking you've actually like a gone warrior. like you've actually gone like half an hour over <laughs> but that's okay it felt like it well, I, it's it's been been so interesting minutes, so i'm like what i'll keep i got a lot of shit to say but yeah this sounds like your podcast man <laughs> yeah exactly uh what so what do you what what do you think i don't know like when you think of the work of parenting what is that yeah, the work of parenting is being there. Uh, the work of parenting is also corroborating their reality. Um, like I have black kids and then you see the images in this country and you see the folks who uh, are doing well on your images and my kids are not represented. And so we have to have the hard work of explaining why. Uh, we have to make sure that they are they understand their worth in a society that don't value people who look like them as much. And so that's hard work. And they and you have to point out the inconsistencies of the society's promise versus the society's practice. Um, right. All of this sort of thing really helps uh, your kids to develop critical thinking skills. And so you don't have to worry about drugs per se because they know how to think. And if they know how to think, then you don't have to worry about drugs. You don't have to worry about uh, video games. You don't have to worry about members of the opposite sex. Uh, and, and whatever, whatever problems might arouse, they arise. They know how to think. Great. Um, the book is called "Drug Use for Grownups." The author is Dr. Carl Hart. Um. Uh, all right. Well, I hope we move some merch, and uh, and uh, it was it was good talking to you. And and oh, one last thing, I just want to get on the record that you don't believe that uh, I talked to you on the phone about the NBA legalized weed, and people were saying on my Twitter that like it's gonna make guys better, and I was like, nah, I don't think weed's gonna make people better at uh, 
sport. No, I don't think so. Um, maybe there's somebody who feels more relaxed and they perform better in a game or two, but in general, I don't think so. And and same with 100 meters, same like there's no no. If they want 100 meters, there are better there are better drugs that will help their performance, but it's not marijuana. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, apparently sprinters with ADHD um, who have to take baseball players. Ritalin. Oh, baseball do a lot players. of baseball players have oh, it too? That oh, the number of guys. baseball players just shot up with ADHD. Yeah, it's what it's a scourge. Um, <laughs> all right, buddy. Uh, thank you, everybody. Buy the book; it's a great book. Even the so there's. Uh, we scratch the surface. Neil, man, it's great to see you. And I you hope well. I hope to see you soon. Uh, to hook you up, I hope to see you. All right, buddy. <laughs> I'll see you, man. All right.